The 6 o'clock news starts right now. New at 6, the athletic director at a Hill Country school accused of indecency with a child is behind bars in Kirk County. Kirk County deputies arrested 47-year-old Damian Patrick Van Winkle at his home today. Child Protective Services made the Kirk County Sheriff's Office aware of the allegations against Van Winkle back in early March. We are told the case began after several students reported inappropriate contact by Van Winkle. At least one of the alleged victims is under the age of 17. His official charge, one count of indecency with a child by contact. Van Winkle is on paid administrative leave right now. The Kirk County Sheriff's Office is looking into whether there may be more potential victims out there. In other news now, she's accused of hiring an undercover officer to commit murder. Investigators say that she wanted to kill her boyfriend's sister over money, and today that woman took the stand in her own defense. And Helica Navarro de Paz is facing a charge of solicitation of capital murder. Erica Hernandez was in the courtroom and reports the defendant's testimony didn't get far as the defense's case came under scrutiny. Terrorized. Jurors heard a recording of what prosecutors say were conversations between Angelica Navarro de Paz and an undercover police officer. This audio revealing details behind the deals made between Navarro de Paz and the officer, who we are not showing because he works undercover. She's actually counting. I think it's uh, 850, it's half of the 1700, uh, and she's just counting it. Navarro de Paz is facing a solicitation capital murder charge accused of hiring that officer to kill her boyfriend's sister over a $40,000 debt. That undercover officer also testified that after she paid him half for this job, she asked about possibly hiring him again for another hit on a different person. She told me she had another lady that owed her $70,000. Um, she said, right now, I, don't, I honestly don't have money to, to pay you after finishing this. After the state rested, Navarro de Paz took the stand. She told the jury in Spanish her relationship with the woman dates back to 2014. But when the defense tried to talk about what may have led to the alleged hit and claims of threats to Navarro de Paz and her family, the judge excused the jury for a hearing. Most people are being held out by a criminal organization and she messed with their property. In the end, Judge Melissa Skinner ruled that anything not having to do with the incident or the victim could not be allowed in court. Testimony will continue tomorrow morning. At the Kitten Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Leon Valley Police want to know if you know anything about a road rage shooting that ended, the, ended with the death of a 17-year-old. So this happened on April 19th of last year. Investigators say that 17-year-old Eric Torres was shot and killed while driving in the 7200 block of Hebner Road. Now that's the SUV that they think the deadly shots were fired from. Two other people inside of Torres's car were also hit, but they survived. According to detectives, a car similar to the one that Torres was riding in may have been involved in a road rage situation before this shooting. And the suspects mistook this car for the one that they were actually looking for. So police say this is a murder investigation. San Antonio police also looking for some help tracking down whomever was behind the wheel of this car when it hit a man north of downtown last week. That man is still in the hospital. Officers say the victim was riding a bicycle near Evergreen Street and Main Avenue when he was hit on April 22nd. But the driver of this BMW didn't stop or try to help. We're told they kept on going, leaving the victim with serious injuries. If you have any information on either case, call Crime Stoppers 210-224-STOP. The light of day isn't shedding any light on the person who carried out a deadly shooting last night on the city's northwest side. Two of the three victims died from their wounds. Police say that they were sitting in a car in a parking lot between a bar and an apartment complex on Fredericksburg Road right near Medical Drive. And as Katrina Weber reports, it's been the site of other recent deadly violence. San Antonio police officers called to a shooting before 10 last night found three victims still inside their car. But they quickly realized they had many more questions about what happened in this parking lot in the 5500 block of Fredericksburg Road. It's still very preliminary in this investigation. Um, ICID detectives are out here working hard trying to uh, figure out what was the motive in this murder. Even so, they were not able to find out much. Police say a man and woman who were shot died of their wounds. 
Another woman was rushed to a hospital in critical condition. Very few witnesses. There was very few people who saw this happen. Some people's cars were still there this morning with signs of being hit by the gunfire. The parking lot sits between Highlander Bar and an apartment complex. Police couldn't say if the victims had ties to either place. This is at least the second time recently that there's been a shooting in this very parking lot. But so far, no one with the bar or the apartments has anything to say about it. On the morning of March 1st, police found two men shot here, one dead from his wounds. It was another case shrouded in mystery. But this time, police hope the public will help them solve it. Anything you heard, anything you saw, uh, cameras, anything helps uh, the detectives in an investigation. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. He is finally back in the U.S. And in fact, he's right here in San Antonio. Former U.S. Marine Trevor Reed freed from Russia in a prisoner exchange. He arrived at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland overnight. Reed had been sentenced to nine years in prison in Russia. Authorities there say that he assaulted police. He and his family, though, have denied those claims. Our Alicia Barrera is live from Bamsi this evening. So Alicia, of course, his family thankful that he is now back in the U.S., but they're concerned about his health. Absolutely. According to a spokesperson for the Reed family, they say that Trevor Reed is receiving medical care and it's there are reports that he could be here at Bamsey. However, that information as well as how long he could be here for has not been confirmed by federal authorities. But take a look at the video from early this morning when Trevor finally made his way back to the U.S. It was about 1230 a.m. when the plane finally touched down at JBSA Lackland, where his congressman and family welcomed him. The family has publicly thanked President Joe Biden, but also Congressman August Pfluger and Senator John Cornyn for continually advocating and working to bring Reed back. We're so thankful for President Biden meeting with us and then taking this swift action after meeting with him. We believe that he probably has saved our son's life. Congressman Pfluger sent the following statement to KSAT 12 that reads in part, standing on the tarmac alongside Trevor Reed's loving parents to watch him take his first steps back on free America's soil is a moment I will never forget. Texas never forgot about Trevor Reed, and today we welcome him home as an American people. And as you can imagine, many people wanting to hear from Trevor Reed him, from him himself to see how he's doing. His parents have stated that they are concerned about his health, but according to the family's Twitter account, they won't be hearing the public will not be hearing from Trevor anytime soon. And I think that's something that we can all understand as it's been a very long time coming for the Reed family. Reporting live, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Alicia, thank you. New at six, community leaders launched a new plan today to help local students succeed. So it's called Up Partnership, and it's coordinating the Future Ready Bear County plan. Its CEO says that the community has way too many inequities based on factors like race, zip code, or household income. So the pandemic, we also know, has made things worse. So they're saying that 50 institutions have made specific commitments to advance healing, access, and voice. Alamo Promise is, uh, is going to continue to be scaled by the Alamo Colleges to ensure more college affordability. The uh, CAS Schools Network is going to continue to scale Youth Voice to make sure that our young people are heard. Uh, Good Samaritan Community Services is going to continue to ex expand its college access and readiness programs. Uh, yeah, it's a multi-pronged approach, and the plan's ultimate goal is to increase the percentage of Bear County High School students enrolled in post-secondary or credential programs. Up Partnership CEO says that that number is currently at about 50 percent, but by 2030, it wants to hit 70 percent. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. This is the camera here at a familiar trouble spot at this hour, mm -hmm. 281 Loop 410. You can see it is very slow going on the ramp there from 281 headed on to 410. But take a look down below. Nobody's going anywhere fast on the main lanes of 410 themselves. Typical rush hour traffic. Well, today we got a look at another addition to the affordable housing market in our area. These are the new Arcadian Apartments. They're located in Converse at East Loop 1604 and I-10. The NRP Real Estate Group and the San Antonio Housing Authority hosting a tour today. These apartments are part of a workforce program to help those looking for a more affordable place to live. 
the need for affordable housing is going to be even greater than it was uh, in the years past and as we continue to move on. Now, there are 324 units here at the Arcadian. Affordable housing is also part of the city of San Antonio's bond proposal, and early voting for that is underway right now. Now we're going to take things back outside. Here's a live cam. It's our south side city cam where you could see the day is almost, I mean, pretty soon it's going to be dark. 85 degrees right now, and Adam really can't complain when it's 85 degrees. Yeah, it could be a lot hotter this time of yeah. year, but the low clouds really kept the temperatures at bay. And so we did make it to 87 officially for the high aquifer leveled off. It was rising the past couple of days from recent rainfall. It fluctuated downward a little bit, one tenth of a foot. But I do want to point out we still have high mold count at 2300. It's on the way down. Oak is high at 620. Oak season's coming to an end quickly. Pecan grass both on the low end. 80s now. Bandera 85. Lost Maples 82 degrees. Pleasanton 88. And Stinson on the south side measuring 92. But we'll gradually fall through the 80s and 70s this evening. Other than a bit of a wind out there, southeast 10 to 20 and some humidity. Pretty comfortable. 76 at 10 o'clock midnight, 72. Newest drought monitor is in. We'll compare that to last week, see what kind of changes were made, and our next chance of storms when that arrives in just a bit. Holding out hope on a new deal, the musicians of the San Antonio Symphony have spent seven months on strike, locked in a fight over finances. The similar struggles that one city symphony faced and how it managed to survive. New at six, President Joe Biden has talked about his struggles with it. Same goes for James Earl Jones, Bruce Willis. They're among three million people in the U.S. with a chronic stutter. There's no cure for the speech issue where sounds and syllables, words or phrases are disrupted. But Ursula Perry reports there's been a new discovery that takes us one step closer. Communication, socioeconomic status, even employability. The challenges for people who stutter are profound. Some believe those who stutter have lower intelligence or the stutter is the result of a childhood trauma. This has all been proven to be false. The one thing we know about stuttering is that it is absolutely genetic. Now researchers have been able to pinpoint some genes that are associated with stuttering. These include genes linked to a dopamine pathway. Suggesting that there might be something about how the brain is processing and signaling that could be disrupted in, in stuttering. As well as genes associated with how hormones are regulated and processed in the body. Professor Below and colleagues inputted all of these sets of traits into a data bank with 100,000 genetic samples. And we're able to identify almost 10,000 people who our algorithm, algorithm predicted might stutter. Including co-author of the study, Robin Jones. The Stuttering that I had, you know, it began around four years of age. For people who stutter, they n know exactly what they want to say, but they're not able to s say it. And now this may be the first step in giving them that voice. Communication is a quintessential aspect of the human experience. The researchers have now partnered up with 23andMe, a genomics company, and what they're looking at is the DNA for about 100,000 people who identify as those who stutter, as well as a million others who do not, to find out if there are any additional genes to consider. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 now flying high above Holotus and Cornival. Oh, it looks like a lot of fun. Not too many underway. people out there right now. That's I'm sorry. I kind of like that, especially because, you know, when it's packed, it just tends to be really hot and not fun. But at 85 degrees, you really can't complain, Adam. Yeah, it's not bad at all today outside. I mean, it's pleasant. We're just a little above average mm -hmm. for this time of year, and the humidity is not outrageous either. We'll take a look at the dew points in one second. Let's get right to what we want to talk about. New drop monitor is in. Very soon we're going to compare that to last week, see what kind of changes have been made. Next storm chance doesn't come until this weekend, late on Saturday. Then high temperatures basically from here on out just right around 90 degrees, give or take a bit. Okay, let's look at our next storm chances. We talked about Saturday. That would be late Saturday, mainly evening into Saturday night, and then again Sunday night into Monday morning. But 
it's only at 20% right now. We don't have a whole lot of confidence in much really developing, and if it does, it should be very isolated, so the coverage being very limited. Okay, this is last week's drought monitor. This is what it was before the rain came. Here we go, three, two, one. And you see, we did cut back on the drought a little bit farther to the south, especially Webb County, but then it also expanded even more and got even worse farther to the north around Gillespie County, Fredericksburg area and northward up toward Waco. And obviously we could use more rain. What we had earlier this week was great. Don't get me wrong. We'll take it. But just what I call a drought denter, not a drought busting rainfall. But if we could just drum up more of those, then we'd be in good shape. But as I showed you, those storm chances are pretty slim. We're getting the typical pop up afternoon storms over the mountains of Mexico this afternoon. Beautiful satellite imagery, isn't it? And you see the blow off clouds being carried eastward toward Eagle Pass, Kamado area. Otherwise, around here, these puffy cumulus clouds will be dissipating this evening as we lose our daytime heating. There's the radar view of those storms. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like they'll make it to the Rio Grande. They should fizzle out way before they'd get there. And otherwise, fairly quiet across the state of Texas. A few disturbances out there, nothing major right now. A little dip in the flow near Chicago and St. Louis, a few showers there. Pacific Northwest, another a bigger dip in the upper level flow, a bigger trough, and it's those troughs that we need to really generate good showers and thunderstorms. We just don't have one within the foreseeable future, but let's fast forward to Saturday. That's when we have a weak cold front that's going to drop near our area. Saturday during the day, more of the same. T well, tomorrow, more of the same. Saturday, more of the same. Morning clouds, afternoon sun. You know the drill, a bit windy at times as well. Highs near 90. It's sat Saturday evening into Saturday night when we could have a few thunderstorms developing, particularly parts of the hill country and up closer to Austin. And then the off chance that some of those could make their way a little closer to San Antonio and even Highway 90. But again, still a 20% chance. It's a conditional situation. Things really need to come together properly. And if we do st see any storms develop, they should be very limited in their actual coverage with their rainfall. But they do just develop and actually be likely to become strong to severe as well. So something to watch. 84 now. Dew point is 62. Dew point's not too bad. I mean, a bit of humidity in the air, but it's not oppressive. We're in that 60 to 60 degree range. Kerrville 61, Pleasanton 65, Kennedy. Dew point is 62. This time of year, you basically just have to get used to the humidity. And remember, it takes that humidity to make rain. It's not always such a bad thing. All right, temperatures now, for the most part, 80. Some exceptions. Catula at 92 degrees. Even Castroville 91. Stinson still at 92. Meanwhile, Seguin at 84. Tomorrow morning, we'll start the day upper 60s for most of us, some lower 70s, Pleasanton, south side of San Antonio, about 71 degrees. But then by the afternoon, we're well into the 80s, just flirting with 90. I mean, 88 New Braunfels, 89 Castroville, Divine at 90 degrees, and around San Antonio, I think about 89 for the high. Here's your case at 12 hour forecast. Low clouds again to start the day tomorrow, so another gray start to the day. By the afternoon, we'll start to see those the sun gradually come out, making it into the upper 80s and a bit windy at times, but nothing out of the ordinary. Some gusts to 25 miles per hour. I wish we had more rain chances to throw onto that seven day forecast or even a situation where we could see the likelihood of increasing rain chances, but it's just that little 20% here and there this weekend. Overall, not too bad. Thanks, Adam. But we're really excited because yeah. the draft is tonight. And we're NFL watching draft. some local prospects. Yeah, I believe we have five local prospects, including mm -hmm. DeMarvin Leal out of Judson High School. And he should be the first San Antonio area guy hearing his name called. And there he is getting a fresh haircut before the draft tonight. And fellow NFL draft prospect Spencer Burford out of UTSA is ready to eat. Coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. It's a special day for the big Ocho DeMarvin Leal, who soon live out his childhood dream of playing in the National Football League. NFL draft starts tonight, and Leal is one of several area football players eligible for this year's NFL draft. Round one is tonight, rounds two and three tomorrow night, and finally rounds four through seven on Saturday. Marv is holding a draft watch party with family and friends here in town at an Airbnb, and that's where we met him late this afternoon, where he was getting a fresh haircut before his big night. So we asked him, how's he feeling nervous good excited you know you work your whole life for this you know one moment this one day so it's ready to get the day going you know time is against me so it's waiting for time to catch up 
What would you now tell little Marv a long, long time ago as he anticipated the build up to this night? Uh, keep working. Keep listening, keep being, you know, sponge, just taking in all the wisdom, all the, you know, just everybody's like their their information of how to play the game, just how to be, you know, you basically just be confident, be you, keep moving. Who do you have here tonight at this draft party? Um, close ones, family members, you know, even, you know, friends, agents, you know, just my inner circle. Your mom was telling me it was important to have uh, your grandparents here? Definitely, definitely was. You know, my grandpa, he's 90 years old, blind. Grandma, she's right behind him. And, hey, it's just a blessing to still have them in this world. Here, they watch me in this moment. Who's more nervous, you or your mother? Uh, probably my mom, honestly. <laughs> you know, being, you know, the second, her baby, basically. And, you know, this moment comes. So I know she's probably freaking out in the inside, but it's okay. The last thing, what's your message for San Antonio Judson Rocket fans as we watch and wait for your name to be called? I uh, appreciate all the support. You know, y'all have had my back since, you know, high school, even before then. And, you know, to everybody that's not here at, my, at the, you know, draft party, still love you guys. Still, you know, appreciate everything that everybody has done for me. And so just stay tuned. We will. The UTSA Roadrunners have a handful of draft prospects in this year's draft, including star running backs and Sear McCormick, offensive lineman Spencer Burford, and cornerback Tariq Woolen. Burford from Wagner High School was a four-year starter at UTSA, starting at every position except center. Mock drafts see him going on day three in rounds four through seven. You have to have a dedication to it. Um, uh, at the end of the day, you have to look a grown man in the eye and be able to take food off his plate. That's basically what it is. Like We're going here to take grown men's jobs, men with families. And so sometimes it's not personal, but at the same time it is. Because it's either eat or starve at this point. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough business to be in, but at the same day, it's very rewarding on the back end. So, I mean, it has its pros and cons, but I'm just glad to be in a position that I am. Woolen improved his draft stock big time after his lightning performance at the NFL Scouting Combine, running the 40 in 4.26 seconds, the second quickest at the Combine this year. He told the media at UTSA Pro Day he's hearing he can go in the first three rounds. And other local draft prospects Baylor. include Baylor Bears safety and steel knight JT Woods, plus Stevens alum Elijah Garcia, a defensive lineman from Rice. The draft starts at 7 p.m. live right here on KSAT 12. All right, good stuff, Larry. Thank you. All right, coming up next, we're going to talk about these hepatitis cases discovered in children and what we know about what's happening right here in San Antonio. That's in our KSAT Q&A next. From largely unexplained and severe cases of hepatitis in kids to potentially the first COVID vaccine for young ones being approved. We have so much to discuss today with our KSAT Q&A guest. And now we want to welcome Dr. Tess Barton. She is the pediatric infectious disease specialist with UT Health San Antonio. Yeah, Dr. Good to see you. Thanks for being here as always. Let's first start with this hepatitis topic. Today, UT Health did confirm that a child right here in San Antonio is being treated for serious liver disease. A lot to explain when it comes to this issue, but first, do we know what's causing these hepatitis cases in kids? At the moment, we don't have definitive information about what the cause is. Um, from what we know from the outbreaks um, in other countries that have uh, kind of preceded us that have been investigated, it does appear to likely be a virus. Um, and most of the cases, um, for instance, in the UK, were related to a virus called adenovirus 41, um, but not all the cases. So the, the definitive cause is still being determined, um, but it does look like it's likely going to be this adenovirus. And what is an adenovirus? What kind of symptoms are we talking about here? So adenovirus is actually an extremely common virus, but there are dozens of different strains of that. And so we see adenovirus is actually the cause of pink eye. It's the cause of many common colds, and it's a common cause of diarrhea in children. But what kind of illness you get sort of depends on which strain you get. Um, so this adenovirus 41 is typically a diarrhea virus mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't it usually it can cause some liver inflammation but 
historically, it hasn't caused severe liver disease. It's not a new virus. It's a virus that's been around a while. And the question is, is that virus perhaps changing um, to cause more severe liver disease? If I'm a parent, I'm wondering, okay, what can I do to protect my child? So if you could explain. Sure. So, you know, we have um, other viruses that cause hepatitis that we have vaccines for, like hepatitis A and hepatitis B, but we don't currently have a vaccine for adenoviruses that we use routinely. So, um, so really the, the way that we prevent adenovirus is being transmitted is the way that we prevent all other viruses from being transmitted, which is good hand washing, you know, washing your hands before you eat, washing your hands after you go to the bathroom, you know, for parents, washing your hands before you prepare food and change diapers. Um, and, you know, that those are kind of the normal, the normal ways that we, you know, attempt to prevent these types of viruses. So it sounds like a big question that researchers want to answer is, okay, if this adenovirus has been around a long time, but now it's causing really severe symptoms in kids, why? So as we kind of wait for that answer, what do parents need to be looking at in terms of symptoms of this? So I think that, you know, probably the most important thing for parents and for pediatricians at this point is really to be on the lookout. So this type of illness usually will begin with kind of a gastroenteritis or a stomach bug, right? So like vomiting and diarrhea. Um, and most of those stomach bugs from viruses will come and they will go within a few days. So if it's not going away, um, and most importantly, if, if a child begins to develop jaundice, which is a yellowing of the, usually begins with the white of the eyeballs and then progresses to the rest of the skin, that's a sign that the liver is involved. Um, and, and so pediatricians, most pediatricians offices are able to do liver function testing where they can see is your liver inflamed or not as a screening test. And if it is inflamed, then that might be a reason to though, then go and try to investigate further to see if, if this is possibly one of these cases of hepatitis. So basically gastrointestinal issues that don't go away. That's when parents should really say, okay, we got to go straight to the, pre the pediatrician. That and jaundice, you know, uh, yes. most, most, most um, you know, regular, you know, stomach bugs, stomach flus uh, don't cause jaundice. And so if you see jaundice, that needs to be investigated immediately. Okay, now let's talk COVID. You know, Moderna wants the FDA to approve its vaccine for kids under six years old. We know that the kids would have to be at least six months old to get it. What else can you tell us about this? So the Moderna vaccine, um, it looks like they, uh, you know, the studies that were done show that it's reasonably effective. The vaccines, all the vaccines, both the Pfizer and the Moderna in these younger children are sort of less effective than what we've seen in older children and teenagers and adults. Um, and, and it's a little bit difficult to assess that because many of the studies were done during these variant surges like the Omicron, where overall the effectiveness of the vaccines was a little bit lower. Um, but I think most importantly, you know, the, one of the things that, of course, everybody's been looking out for is vaccine safety. And, um, and the, the clinical trials um, show that this, you know, this vaccine like the Pfizer vaccine for the older children appears to be safe. And so um, I think that this, you know, it's not, nothing is perfect, it's not a perfect vaccine, but um, I think that all the things that we can possibly have in our toolbox to try to just prevent, you know, reduce the amount of virus that's circulating in our community is, is all a piece that we can do. So parents who are very eager to get, to get that, I think will be, will be waiting with bated breath for um, the opportunity to vaccinate kids when they're concerned. Yeah, and once that is available for these younger ones, what advice do you have? What message do you have for parents who are still weighing that option and saying, okay, maybe my child doesn't have some of these high risk factors that certainly kids who do, you know, they especially need the vaccine. What's your message to those still considering this? Sure. I mean, I think that every family should sort of look at their family situation. And, you know, if if a child has high risk um, conditions that might predispose them to more severe COVID disease, then obviously, you know, parents should be considering that. But it's not just the child. Right. So, you know, children live in families and they interact with other family members. And so, again, looking at kind of the entire family, we know that people who have impaired immune systems don't respond well to the vaccines. 
Older people don't respond as well to the vaccines, and so they can still, you know, be vaccinated and potentially get infected. And so anything that we can do to kind of just reduce virus spread within a family is generally beneficial to that family. So for parents who are kind of on the fence and, you know, wanting to see, I think um, I think that, you know, every family is different and look at your family and see if this looks like something that actually might be beneficial for you. All right, Dr. Tess Barton, infectious disease specialist with UT Health San Antonio. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. All right, always good to have you. We'll be right back. There was a new metallic member of an emperor penguin colony in Antarctica. The tiny robot named Echo is living with penguins as it gathers information. These unmanned ground vehicles will help scientists study the vulnerability of marine ecosystems and potential problems that could be caused by climate change. So the team says this is going to help them collect data year round while having less impact on the animals overall. The robot doesn't appear to be making any waves. <laughs> the researchers also say the penguins appear to getting along well with Echo. I wonder what they're thinking. I would love to know. If they're like, what I is that? Who any, are you? Any penguin video, they're it's adorable like for it. It's true. <laughs> Although it's weird to see penguins when you've got weather like this, right? I mean, we're not going to trade places with them. No, Thanks. no, this is true. What would be the perfect te temperature year round for you, Myra, again? What you were talking said, about the other day. Yesterday, I said it's high of 75, low mm -hmm. of 58, 20% uh, humidity. Very specific. Yeah, I like it. Someone Boring. Someone asked me on Instagram. I answered, and that was his response. Boring. Boring. Well, you're not, you're not invited to my year-round season. <laughs> I didn't then. get that invite, <laughs> so I figured. 84 degrees. You wouldn't appreciate it anymore if you didn't have the changes. And then you'd be like, it's too cold for the pool, too cold for the beach. Where's my beach weather? All right, this evening, temperatures falling through the 70s. We've got a great thermometer Thursday for you. We're going to get into that in just a bit and talk about our next storm chance coming up. Welcome back. You know, it's been a calm few days, but we can't forget the rain that we had earlier this week. I'm just wondering what kind of a dent it put on our drought situation. Well, we know we need more, right? Yeah, that's true. That's just it. I mean, it was a drought denter, but not a drought buster at all. It you know, boosted the aquifer about a foot and a half. So that's better than nothing. And it, it greened things up for a little bit. But let's take a look at where we are compared to average. And since April 1st, we've had 1.21 inches officially at the airport. I know more or and less in other parts of town. So that's about an inch below average month to date since January 1st, almost 3.6 inches. So year to date, we're about 4.6 inches below average for precipitation. Still got to make up a lot of ground and especially try to wipe away the drought that we have. And you look at the satellite and radar, typical activity popping up in the mountains over Mexico, some showers and thunderstorms there. We're getting some of the blow off clouds between Del Rio and Eagle Pass, but that's it. And those clouds we had through the day today, they're dissipating as the sun sets and we lose the daytime heating, the energy from the sun. Across the rest of the state, very quiet. No major system to talk about right now, but there is one that's coming on shore. This trough, that dip in the upper level flow. That's kickstarting some showers in the Pacific Northwest, spreading, spreading basically eastward through parts of the Rocky Mountains and into Wyoming. That's going to be more of a heavy hitter for the northern tier of the United States, but it is going to develop a cold front that's going to come pretty close to us this weekend. So let's fast forward to Saturday. This weak cool front drops in and it's not going to move through town. It's actually going to stall somewhere to the north of us Saturday evening, probably Edwards Plateau, Northern Hill Country area, and it could be just enough to kickstart a few showers and thunderstorms, particularly north of Highway 90 Saturday evening. It's not going to get in the way of any Saturday plans, even through the afternoon. It's late Saturday. We're talking sunset and even thereafter when it could kickstart a few and then maybe even some of them drift southward or their outflow boundaries move southward and develop a new storm closer to town. It's the off chance still, but it's our only opportunity in the near future. It's one of the few opportunities, I should say. The, the thing is with that is if a storm does develop, it could become strong to severe pretty quickly Saturday evening and night. So something we'll keep you updated on. 69 this morning, a high temperature of 87, both of those well above average, but you check out our record high of 99 set back in 2014. That gives you an idea of just how hot it could get this time of year. 
Currently we're at 84. Dew point is 62, relative humidity 47%. So remember that means these air is holding about 40 seven percent of the moisture it can at this given temperature. Eagle Pass 88, Catula 92, 86 New Braunfels, Kennedy at 85 degrees and for the most part we're just well into the 80s and these temperatures will fall off pretty quickly this evening and will fall through the 70s and then settle in the upper 60s for most of us tomorrow morning. Nixon Smiley about 69 degrees and 68 New Braunfels, Burning Bandera 66. Then we get into tomorrow afternoon and we'll be just a few degrees warmer, about 90 in Floresville, even Port S.A. and the south side of San Antonio, about 90 degrees. Here's your case at 12 hour forecast. Low gray clouds to start the day again tomorrow. Typical routine. Cloudy start that 10% chance, a few sprinkles right near 70 at 8 a.m. We get to the noon hour, 78 degrees, still mostly cloudy, but starting to see some breaks in those clouds and a little bit of sun, then decent amount of sunshine into the afternoon, right near 90 degrees. And you look ahead, I wish we had more rain chances to throw onto that seven day forecast, but right now it's just not into the in the works. However, I do anticipate a few shifts in our weather pattern as we get toward the end of next week and the following weekend, just something we can at least cross our fingers for that uh, with any luck would give us better hope for some rain. I've been taking you on my adventure and my journey of making my newest thermometer for the barometer, hygrometer, th uh, thermometer, you know, uh, instrument panel that I have. So let's get right to this. I've measured the glass, I've cut the glass, sealing the glass, and then the next step is to blow the glass, to blow the bulb. There we go. We have to speed up time, but we're going to slow it down right here just to give you an idea of what I look like as I'm doing this <laughs> and what the glass looks like as I'm doing this. There's my initial bulb. That's not enough, my friends. Not enough. We need more volume inside that thermometer. So I make a secondary bulb and try to connect it to that initial bulb. So I work my way up the glass a little bit and okay, I'm doing this in a matter of about 10 minutes, but let me tell you, my first hundreds of thermometers took probably 20 to 30 minutes to do this, okay? Mm -hmm. But, and now I'm warming it strategically in between those two bulbs to just disperse the heat right enough. But, and I like what I have, these two bulbs, but with the length of this thermometer, <laughs> I want more volume. That'll give me a better resolution. So we'll speed it up again. Now I'm focusing on the very end of the thermometer, the tip there, heating that up and then ta-da! There and we are. This is why they all look different. All of yes. these bulbs look, they're unique. They're, I like to say they're like snowflakes because no two are identical. It's basically impossible for me to make them identical. But I, can't, I just simply can't manually do that. You know, they can be similar, but that's why they take on those funny shapes. And I love those funny shapes. And that's uh, part of the charm of them, if you will. Should we but call that, this a uh, Caskey cam? Is that what that is? We can call it that now. I do like it. I, by the way, four and a half minutes in, I do like that look. It's a look of self-satisfaction. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yes, you were like, yes. Tell me about it. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> Susana Jimenez of San Antonio, the one I just uh, sent the email to. That's Susana Jimenez, homemade thermometer winner. You go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. Next week on Caskey Cam. Yes. <laughs> we'll Congratulations, That's what we're Susana. Doing. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Good morning to you. It is Thursday, April 28th. New this morning, released just yesterday from Russian custody, former U.S. Marine Trevor Reed is back stateside and made a quick stop here in San Antonio. Reed, who was only passing through San Antonio, was at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland just after midnight. Here's the video. Reed is on the final part of his trip home. He was released, was part of a prisoner swap that came as a surprise to many around the world. Reed's parents, who live in Granbury, were at Lackland to greet their son. This could be a little disturbing. Watch right here on your screen. That's a car being chased by police and watch what happens. That was a teenager jumping out of that moving car during that police chase. Looked like the teenagers nailed that guardrail pretty hard. This happening in Columbus, Ohio. That teenager jumped out of the car the police were chasing because it was allegedly stolen. Here's the part that makes you go, huh? The teen was wearing a neck brace because he had been in a previous accident in a stolen car. A fire in a kitchen starts burning out of control and spreads inside a home on the northeast side. Firefighters say that fire ended up spreading to the garage and then up into the attic. A family of four and their dog made it out safe, but are now without a home. 
In other news, a peaceful end to an hours-long standoff on the northwest side. And now 48-year-old Christopher Lombrano faces domestic violence-related charges. Bear County deputies went to the apartment to execute family violence-related warrants around noon, but Lombrano refused to come out and threatened to blow up the place if deputies came any closer. And the deputies retreated, and about three hours later, that's when negotiators made their move. Sheriff Javier Salazar says that Lombrano had knives on him, but not guns. All right, now we want to alert you to some traffic that we're seeing along the southeast San Antonio here. This is I-10 at Probance right there, and you're looking at the westbound lanes there at um, 35. So you can see, obviously, traffic there down to a crawl. Now, we're getting a, an exact look at where the traffic, like what started this entire thing. So it looks like after that, traffic is going okay. But just to let you know, there is traffic in that yeah, area. Yeah, cones being put out right now. Things definitely slow going, I-10 at 35 here. Pretty quiet weather-wise this evening. Pleasant, though. Temperatures falling through the 70s tomorrow near 90. That'll be the case through the weekend. Just that slight chance of a few pop-up storms late Saturday and late Sunday. All for right, now, thanks. enjoy the rest of the week because it's looking pretty good out there. <laughs> thanks for watching. We'll see you on the night beat.